four, three. Oh, uh, Lisa, for the... whatever that music was, it's got me jumping around. Kind of bubbly here up here. It's getting ready for a New Year's Eve celebration. A very 80s of you, darling. <laughs> um, all right, so I know that uh, everybody's e email box is full of last chance, last 12 hours. Save, <laughs> send money now. Send money now to... I don't, know, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen so many calls for cash <laughs> from the many not-for-profits and causes that I get mail from. Have you, Tom Clark, ever seen so many? It is, without a doubt, the biggest avalanche. And part of it is how many times I've heard from the same place in the last week of the year. Exactly, exactly. Three days left, two days left. I know. Your last day to send a check. I know. So much for us asking for money. Well, we, <laughs> we're trying kidding. to just say come and be here rather than begging people for dough. Um, I'd <laughs> like to welcome Tom Clark to the stage. Tom is the uh, director, founder of uh, Community Media Workshop. Um, a, an incredible institution in Chicago that has as its mission to help not-for-profits, community groups, and other on-the-ground efforts get the news of their efforts and the struggle that they uh, encounter out. Is that correct? That it sounds like a great way to do it, and it's great to be with you both at the end of the year. Yeah, I asked Tom to come on today because uh, as much as anyone I know, Tom keeps his finger on the pulse of, of all that's happening, both locally and nationally and inter internationally, all of them. And, um, you know, all the TV and radio stations do the 2011 year in review, yada, yada. And uh, I guess I wanted to do the same and remind ourselves of what, um, what we just went through, um, the questions that remain, the unfinished business, if you will, of 2011, and, uh, and what you think are the most important aspects that we should carry from that. Well, it's been an interesting year because as I was thinking about doing this show and share with some colleagues, we, I thought we'd end up talking about Occupy and um, drones and ROM, not necessarily in that order. Drones and ROM, huh? Yes. And of that course, sounds like they go together somehow. And, and my colleague said, oh, don't talk about drones. Don't <laughs> drone on about the, what, you know. Don't drone but, on. But we could get to that kind of stuff internationally. Because Why don't you knock it off quickly? Do the drone first. Well, what's interesting is that our, our president has used more of them than anyone else up until now. It is our new form of warfare. It is um, an incredible new set of systems, and we could spend the whole rest of the show talking about it. I'm not sure I want to dwell on it other than just make the point that um, in this upcoming political year, foreign policy doesn't seem to be that big a deal, and yet our um, uh, socialist Kenyan president... Um, has had quite a year what of it. What did you just say? Socialist leaning? Kenyan president. Kenyan. Um, has certainly had an interesting time in the foreign policy front and, and has asked our Mayor Rahm to tie those two things together to host world leaders here in May. So um, I think as we come out of 2011 and, and look at the next year, it, international affairs is going to be very much a local story. I guess that was really more the point I was trying to make uh -huh. earlier in looking at how do we look at the, this past year and what it means because I also remember being in this very space at the beginning of the year when we were in the middle of a mayoral campaign and right. hoping there would be more than just the air apparent that we could talk about and debate and all that and you folks were great in bringing different people on this radio show to, to talk about alternatives to, to who finally won but I'm, I'm tempted to ask you folks, what do you think, now that we've seen six, nine months of the new mayor, um, you know, where do you think we're headed with this international global city with this guy in charge? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to, to both of you, uh, turning the tables here a bit, <laughs> as small business people who um, face a whole bunch of new fees and stuff in order to keep your enterprises going in this city, as the city continues to grow up, as nonprofits and everyone else do with budget issues. Well, I'd, I'd still like to say that um, it's a mixed bag. Yep. Um, and, you know, if in fact a new mayor means things like um, uh, real inspections of places of business that will keep Chicagoans safe, uh, that's a good thing. Um, we had a building inspection last week that I said, 
who called you in? And he said, nobody, this is a regular inspection. I think we've had like four building inspections in the 35 years wow. we were here. So I'm not sure if uh, that's right or not, if that's the kind of timing it should be. I don't think people should be beleaguered by that sort of thing. But at the same time, you've got... I think you pay to be inspected, too. Well, some on some fronts. Uh, yeah. Some inspections you so do they, actually pay for. So they have for. more and more of them. Well, there was uh, the one that we had for years. This uh, mysterious C CFV. To, uh, it, it's a something to do with exhaust inspection, which we never had, but we regularly got cards asking us to pay for it, which we dutifully did. Um, just to keep them away. You know, yeah, just to keep them. <laughs> I, th I think Rom has. Uh, you say it's a mixed bag. I think that uh, there are some real serious questions about the direction. I know people are up against it. Uh, the city is up against it. It's a challenging time uh, everywhere. But I think uh, he, he really uh, has done some things that uh, I would be critical of. I think his kind of blaming of teachers and uh, taking on the union uh, has been a little overboard. I think his... Uh, kind of pushing of charter schools and giving credit to the charter schools uh, for that, more that than then, they deserve. That then uh, was measured not to be the case, that you, charter schools don't do measurably much better than regular schools and oftentimes uh, right on the same I would say low uh, level. as a person who's been photographed in my life trying to t tip over a paddy wagon going back to 68, I think that uh, his police... Uh, arrangements have perhaps been an in, uh, improvement. The new uh, head of the police department, um, I'm not sure about all of his actions, but I sure did like watching him at, uh, with Father Flager. Uh, and I, it'll be interesting, you know, the word is out that the police are much kinder and gentler, so to speak, when it comes to demonstrations. I know you were talking about this the other day, Katie. I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's something we've seen as there are more women on the police department, more uh, non-whites. Uh, you know, it's become more third world uh, in many ways. Uh, and yet there's another side to that, as you've even discussed in this program recently. We have new user fees going into effect in order to practice our First Amendment rights. Um, I may be stretching a point here a little bit, but I think there's a lot of priming of the pump for the G8 presumptive protests that um, everyone from businesses to politicians to, to others are concerned about uh, with this G8 NATO summit coming to town. I, I keep looking forward rather than back, but I think <laughs> I we, we're all kind impulse. of looking at the tea leaves of this really new guy in the block who Quite frankly, though I didn't support him, I wish him the best of success because to the extent he's successful, we will all be better off. And certainly Chicago looks and feels better than a lot of other urban centers right now in the midst of this global economic recession that we're in. Well, so um, if we can all pull together and he lets us work with him, I'm, this is something I think is really exciting and indeed a new page. I know one of the main, one of the issues that's concerning a lot of friends of mine and uh, and certainly a, a slew of uh, folks who work in in the helping industries is the well, actually it's a nationwide trend the sh shutting down of mental health uh, facilities but in Illinois it's been particularly brutal um, the reality of the many many scores of folks who require those services to just to function and that uh, that once again we would be turning folks out, basically. And uh, so many, uh, you either wind up in jail if you are a person who suffers um, uh, some mental health uh, challenges, or you wind up uh, in some kind of hospital, uh, in bed. Uh, this, I don't know what, to what extent um, we're going to leave the the helpless behind in this new age. Um, well, I think it's a sign of the, pretty far. <laughs> the. I think it's a sign of the economic crunch that we're all in. That with a um, a good guy in the governor's chair and a great gal in the county chair, and we'll see about the guy at city hall. That indeed the most vulnerable amongst us seem to be the ones taking the biggest hits. As ever. And, the deja vu I've had with this going back to not quite 68, but the middle 70s, where I'm arriving in the city full time after growing up in the western suburbs, is the deinstitutionalization that was going on right. at that point. And the neighborhood that I was living in, which Michael was also in, uptown, mm -hmm. bore the brunt of that. Um, 
uh, huge migration out of public institutions to smaller community settings. And while everyone thought on paper something that called was a great halfway idea, houses, yes. In fact, the way it was carried out in practice is something that we've lived with for almost two generations now, and I don't think it bodes well uh, what's happening now with budget cuts and these clinics closing. Well, yeah. Tom, you talk about people being left behind. At the same time, uh, when we started this sec segment of the show, you said we we're going to bring up Occupy. So how do those two things, uh, we see a national movement of people raising criticisms about uh, the income distribution and, you know, we have the 1% versus the 99%. Uh, and there's a lot of people, progressives and f many more, who, who take a real heart in this. At the same time, we see... Uh, changes, cuts, things, uh, the, the poor, uh, middle class, working class people bearing the brunt of that. How do you uh, put well, those up against each other? Well, step back maybe a couple of years, when, when the Tea Party movement uh, uh, came into being before it was taken over by corporate interests, um, you, you had a bunch of folks very scared and fearful of what was going on in the economy with their future livelihood, with their kids' livelihood, I think, was really what gave rise to that movement. And it took on an anti-big government tone. But beyond that, I think the original Tea Party thing would have a lot to agree with the occupiers in an interesting way. The Occupy movement of this past year, to my mind, is so exciting with its target of big business as opposed to big government because it created a new space for those of us frustrated that we were losing um, uh, a platform to continue pressing the president, pressing companies, pressing our society in a time of recession to do better. Um, it was very, very hard to have that kind of, kind of conversation going on when the dominant theme because of the way the media works in covering both sides of a story always gave um, um, the Tea Partiers, I think, a little louder voice than maybe they really represented in terms of the whole public. There's no doubt now that while Occupy may not um, represent all of the 99%, it represents a lot more than the 1%, and <laughs> it has created space on uh, the left of center, I think, for the rest of us to step up and step back in and begin getting our work done. What do yep. you think uh, will be the... Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have a, a winner where a lot of the Occupy uh, movement around the country has to alter their, their plans, change their plans. How do you see that uh, changing, or how will they come out of the winter? What do you think will happen in the spring going forward up even to the elections in November? Well, I think that we will find a lot of interesting activity around the G8 NATO summit here in Chicago. I think Chicago will be, uh, uh, to a certain extent, where the whole world will be watching again. Ground zero. Because, Hallelujah. Because who knows if the euro will still exist. Uh, the European economy is really in deep doo-doo. Um, that is one of the issues we'll be discussing here. Ironically, Technical phrase. The... the um, the, 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 the NATO ministers actually want to talk about food security. So I hope you guys are getting your security passes done because I think you would have a few things to say to folks who are concerned about food security around the world. Yeah, I see that happening. I well, think as members of the Live from the Heartland radio show team, or we need to get our press passes in line too. Well, we're, we're trying to work on that <laughs> part of it too because I think there are a lot of great stories to tell, whether it's rooftop gardens, how we're converting vacant lots to... I, I want to get away from this food desert idea and talk about some of the things that people are doing to combat um, um, food choices in um, in this region, in this heartland, if you will, right. um, where we probably grow a little bit too much for ethanol and not enough for sustenance. And I think there's a, just a lot of really good stories that could be connected with this international event that's coming to our city in May. I feel like um, there's so many things that are not addressed uh, every day. Uh, you know, you read the paper and you're, you're getting the story of the tiniest percentage of activity, frankly, um, whether it's talking about what the 1% is up to or talking about what sports stars are doing. And I feel like it's uh, someone has likened it to, you know, fiddling while Rome burned kind of thing. Um, we really do have desperate situations for so many of our population right now, more desperate for more people than any other time in my life, I think. And yet, I don't see that being covered. I don't see 
um, any organized kind of way of looking at what are the what are the realities on the ground for the 99 percent, but m not just for the 90, but for the the lowest 10 percent or 20 percent of our population. I mean, there is there is also the story, for example, of efforts to us uh, uh, lower the vote um, to. Um, Depress the vote. Depress the vote. To suppress Thank you. it, to, to uh, make, make it, it very difficult. hard for citizens to actually uh, exercise the Actually, I was kind of surprised that the Justice Department really took a move on that. I mean, they seem to have struck down at least South Carolina, uh, and it's an ongoing process. Because the Justice Department, sometimes it's, I, don't, I don't understand uh, their attacks on uh, medical marijuana. No. Uh, a lot of things, you know, that uh, it just, I'm not sure who makes these decisions and why. I think that the, know? this administration is actually... Um, Schizoid. Well, okay. Another technical term. Um, yeah, there is probably there are times a schizophrenic... when I think this administration feels the need to prove that they're manly enough to uh, to keep our borders safe and secure. Well, I think it's why Barack has spent so much attention to the leadership of Al Qaeda, so that he could, you know, ride a platform as, "Hey, I took care of things." Well, you referred to him as socialist leaning. We wish. Uh, no, he was making a joke. Okay, Michael. I know. But speaking of the joke, uh, <laughs> I did hear, uh, and I'm sure many people have heard it, that if uh, Barack Obama was a Republican, all the things he's done, they would have put him up on Mount Rushmore by now. Yes, and yep. it's really true. I said it to a beer truck driver the other day, who was a little conservative, but he's an open guy, and he said, "You know, that's true." He said, "You know, all these things he's done." Are, that, People that, by the like way, him more. <laughs> that, by the way, is how Michael checks his political... With, uh, with the bear truck driver. He does, yeah. Well, that's he one figures, of many. Talking, it's not a bad reference point. No, no. It, I talk to everybody. Yes, you know that. Um, go ahead. Um, you know, in the reader uh, yesterday, or the last couple of days, the new issue of the reader, uh, there is a city column by Ben Jarofsky and Mike, Mick Dumpke. And uh, it's... Uh, they have awards for achievements in local politics. Achievements and, in quotes. Yeah, and I, um, I assume that you've read this, Tom. Um, I have. Looked at it. Uh, they really take everybody on, and they're pretty critical of everybody. Yes, they are. And uh, I thought it was really good. And they, uh, one of the things that they do mention is uh, all of the aldermen kind of lining up and voting for the mayor's budget. Back to the mayor. Back to the ROM part of this discussion. Uh, your take on that and why, uh, why all these people uh, just sort of went with the budget. Was it because he was new guy? Was they, was they strong-armed? Uh, were they offered things? You got I, any hints? I suspect a lot of things got offered. This is a very sophisticated political apparatus. Um, they have a lot of young, bright things running stuff, and I suspect there was a lot of backroom um, uh, handshakes that were done. And to the extent that we will hear this spring and summer, despite the city's depleted budget, with certain new uh, developments or deals going forward in certain wards, we may be able to look back on a pattern where why was it the 28 aldermen who were seemingly showing some independent backbone in terms of budget stuff were suddenly um, uh, no longer questioning the mayor's budget but going along with it. Um, and I think at least the published reports of what things he backed off on, like a five or ten year gradual build in for nonprofits having to pay for water right. instead of having to do it all in one felt swoop, mm -hmm. were kind of easy things for him to give up and didn't really significantly change the, the bottom line, but it well, gave some comfort for aldermen who were going to be otherwise opposed to his budget. Well, a smart political operative would have put one or two things in that he could easily exactly. stuck back on. And I, I can't think that Ram did anything but that, right? This guy, if nothing else, has proven to be very smart and to have very savvy people working for him. And they tend to be, I think, like the guy he used to work for in the White House, two or three steps ahead of conventional wisdom. Um, I, I think they really, uh, there's a message a day, there's I a story a day. I think I prefer that in a leader. Uh, it's kind of nice to know that they might be looking ahead around the corner mm -hmm. at the next uh, crisis or situation that they have to deal with. If we do um, save uh, time at the end for one more song, we, sh we should uh, cut to a couple of other issues that um, we haven't touched on yet. How is, in your field, the media field, 
How do we uh, fare Chicagoans in terms of being able to find out what's going on through the variety of media sources that we still have? Operative. We, the, the media landscape continues to shift, and the recession has certainly impacted traditional daily newspapering, which kind of framed the news agenda for, for so many generations. That is still shifting, although they still have a lot of influence. And in Chicago, we have the luxury still of two major daily newspapers, the Sun-Times, which many of us felt Pretty might, skinny these days. might be on their, <laughs> its last legs, has just gotten um, a, new owner. a real new uh, uh, lease on life, although there's an interesting ROM connection there. What's, um, what is that? Well, it is that amongst the new owners, and indeed, um, I'm not talking about the editorial staff now, but the new owners of the Sun-Times, there are definitely Rahm and Manual connections. So it will be intriguing to see if the mayor, if he doesn't see something he likes in the paper, actually will be able to call up a close friend to uh, question that editorial that appeared in the Sun-Times early next year. Yikes. What about the... Uh the, um, if, if you want to know more about that, Greg Hines in Cranes has done a lot of good reporting on this. Um, Cranes, uh, South Town Economist, these were all um, adjunct additions to people's daily newspaper reading uh, some while back. They added a perspective and a little depth to stories that either don't get covered or get covered pretty uh, shoddily in the major dailies. How do we fare as far as the breadth of of information sources. There, there is a pretty rich online news and blog environment uh, today in Chicago that of course hardly existed five years ago. Uh, Chicago's gone a little different path than other cities that have uh, independent and relatively well-funded online news services, hyper-local news services going. Uh, Chicago's tend to be a little more homegrown and a little more dispersed, but there's some really neat reporting going on, and I think some traditional independent reporting outlets, um, whether it's the Chicago Reporter, the Better Government Association, uh, also have new leases on life and are adding to that news mix. Um, the way we get I'm information glad to hear that and about all the that, Chicago Reporter, um, New Lease on Life part. Well, they have just formed a partnership with Channel 5 um, that uh, is part of the Comcast deal when they took over Universal. They were supposed to start working more um, to bring in more local uh, nonprofit news resources, and their newly announced partner in Chicago is The Reporter. Holy So we, we are likely to see the reporter style, Chicago Reporter style investigative reporting having a new platform through Channel 5. That being said, to go back to an earlier point that you were addressing, I think that part of the the caliber of the debate or lack of it in our in our kind of um, civil society right now is that the the traditional style of the way journalists are assigned to cover stuff, cover both sides, and then you'll be objective. It's still very objectionable to me because it tends to elevate often uh, one side far beyond in proportion to its numbers or even veracity. And it's part of part of the, the, the frustration I think many people feel about uh, the way uh, either mainstream media or even these newer um, smaller online outlets are, are trying to cover the world. I, I think we all have, we can all be publishers and we should take advantage of that. Um, but I think it's also true, fair to say that a lot of traditional corporate or legacy media um, is still covering a lot of the way the elite felt about themselves yesterday. They're not really covering us that much. The 99% don't get in that often um, compared to how corporate America is feeling about itself. And that's still getting reflected an awful lot in the pages or online versions of the newspapers. Well, okay. That's a good uh, lot of information for everybody to think about. We want to thank Tom Clark. Uh, he's always great when he comes on the show. We want to thank Fred Anzavino from Theo Ubeke and uh, two of the performers in the current production of Pump Boys and Dinettes over at the No Exit. 